Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad that you could join us today. I'm Marin, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure that your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide a smooth webinar. During the webinar, if you have any technical difficulties, you can use the chat box, and I'll address your concerns. You're welcome to use that chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our upcoming webinars are um, starting in December. Uh, the fifth will have a presentation with James Tanner. Uh, he'll be talking about how to take better photos for uh, genealogy. And then following that, we'll have that, that following Thursday on the 12th, I believe it's the 12th, that Thursday, we'll be hearing from Catherine Grant. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, you can visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we're pleased to hear from Sue Kaufman, who will be giving a presentation on the Clayton Library. Uh, Sue is the Senior Manager of the Houston Public Library Clayton's Li Library Center for Genealogical Research in Houston. With more than 30 years of experience as a geneal genealogy librarian, Ms. Kaufman is a past president of the Texas State Genealogical Society and currently serves as its director of education. And if Sue, uh, while Sue's getting ready uh, and, and shares her presentation, um, we'll, we'll just uh, get things set up. Okay, hello everybody. And let's see if we can do this correctly. Remote technology. Okay. We're gonna talk about, I'd like to hello everybody from Texas. Oh, okay, Marin, everything's okay? And um, if you just could- Oh yes, uh, oh, that's right, do the other one, that's right. Yeah. Do it the other way, okay, great, yes. Okay, now everything's okay, right? Yes, everything looks great. <laughs> Gotta cheat, you could have seen my notes and what I was gonna talk about, Marin, we should have let everybody see the notes, it would have been great. So welcome everybody, Marin, thank you for inviting me to do this. I love talking about libraries and, helping people navigate libraries because there is so much here and at the location that you are going to research where you, for your specific family. So as Mary mentioned, I am in Houston, Texas, and we're gonna talk about the Clayton Library Center for Genealogical Research. We have really, really long names in our special collections units, and we'll talk about those in a second. Our goals for today are how to get out uh, the most of what you can do on the ground. Why should you visit the location? Um, there's a lot of unique material out there and uh, you know we are wonderful to live in a big digital age, but other than Google, we wanna find out how we can find materials that are unique to a location. And we're gonna talk a little bit about planning for your research trip which makes it a, an effective research trip because you know, you're gonna put time and effort and money and you wanna do what you can do at home before you take your family in the car and they tap their feet while you run into a location because all they wanna do is go to lunch, but you need that 15 minutes or 20 minutes or what even makes it into two hours while they're still out in the car, what you can do for uh, the most effective time planning. So let's, uh, we're gonna go a little bit over what we have here at the library in Houston, and then we're gonna talk about trying to find some other libraries that are specific for you, and some of those other things that you can do uh, to be most effective. So the Houston Public Library has three special collections units. We actually have three separate buildings, which is somewhat challenging in of itself because uh, we have to do three separate location searches if you are doing 
Houston and Harris County research, we have the Houston Metropolitan Research Center, which is the archives library. Uh, they hold the archival material, the manuscripts, specifically for Houston and Harris County and some Texas material. We also have another building, which is the African American Library at the Gregory School. It was the first African American elementary school in Houston. And that holds also material for Houston and Harris County. And then we have my library, the Clayton Library Center for Genealogical Research. I told you we have, all three of us have really long names. And we are the international collection of the special collections of the library. Our collection is specifically not only Texas, but an international collection which has historical records dating to colonial and pre-colonial United States history, material on, of course, Europe, Mexico, Great Britain. Um, uh, we also have Canada. We have, of course, a lot of other Eastern European countries. And then we try and collect at least one thing from every county, or if you're familiar with parishes as they have in Louisiana. I'm originally from Illinois, and it was hard to understand that they were parishes, not counties, but I got it. I've been here 15 years now. And um, we try and collect at least one thing from every county or parish. And I can say that our collection is deep enough where we had a customer come in and she was looking in our Alaska collection. Her ancestor had gone up to Alaska in the gold rush. And she actually found a cemetery book that listed him. They never knew what happened to him, but he had died up in Alaska. So we do have a very deep collection. Um, specializing in, of course, the Gulf Coast. And as with libraries, we offer individual reference service to customers who are searching their family history. We only have family history in our collection. So I sometimes call it the cheapest psychological counseling around because we listen to your story. That is what we do. We work with you individually and we uh, guide you into the resources that we have. And then, of course, we do programming and outreach. We go to locations uh, in town. I've gone statewide, national. Um, and of course, we do things like this. So we love the opportunity to share what we have at the library and share our knowledge of helping you find your family. So what kind of stuff do we have? Of course, we have that technical word stuff where we have books, we have genealogy magazines, we have microfilm, we have databases, and then as I mentioned, we have staff. There are specifically nine of us here who are subject specialists and then also generalists. Uh, we have people that do African-American research, lineage research, I uh, specifically do urban research, some Jewish research. We have Louisiana, New York. And then, of course, just a lot of different ethnicities and geographic areas. And as I mentioned, it's what we do 40 hours a week here at the library. So there is more than what's on the internet. Those books are super important because let's talk about a little thing called copyright. Um, a lot of us have come to family history since 2012 when the 1940 census was released and thank goodness for family search thank goodness for ancestry thank goodness for a lot of other databases that we can access but there still are books on the shelves that because of copyright which is usually after 1924 everything before 1924 is in public domain but those things have copyright so they can't be digitized and then there is material in periodicals, genealogy magazines. There's about 25% of available knowledge in genealogy magazines, little articles about um, families, about landowners, two or three pages of landowners in a location, Bible records, county histories, cemeteries, indexes to wills, probates, all those sources that we use that don't get into books. And some of you might be familiar with PERSI, P-E-R-S-I, the Periodical Source Index, which you can find at Find My Past for free, P-E-R-S-I. That is an index to genealogy magazines. And um, you can search by location, you can search by subject, and that will get you some gems that you will not find anyplace else, not digitized, not in books, so you might want to investigate Percy. 
Microfilm, a lot of us are familiar with the microfilm that's at the Family History Library in Salt Lake that used to get sent out to remote locations, but there still is microfilm that is unique um, to places that we, like we, that only have. We have some microfilm that the Family History Library does not have, land records, conveyances, other things like that, that you won't find anyplace else. And then, of course, databases that are local, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then, as I mentioned, staff. So what's interesting about Clayton is we are organized alphabetically by state and then with inside that county because family history is a geographic driven pursuit. So excitedly, we do not use the Dewey Decimal System. So you can go to your state, you can go to your country if you're interested, and just look at that county and see the material that we have. So each one of these variant sources that I have listed, indexes, vital records, passenger lists, will often give you different material and might be unique to the location. Especially in libraries, sometimes people do indexes and they only put one copy at the library where they live, even if it doesn't have anything to do with it. We have some indexes that people have sent us from Virginia that only a few libraries have. We also have locally, locally created indexes that only exist here. There were county histories that were written in the 1950s, 1970s, and I think a lot of us have also come across books that don't have indexes, much to our chagrin, but sometimes people will sit there with the books and create indexes for that library. We have a lot of that too. The other thing that you have to understand is, is there might not be vital records. So when you begin to do family history, a lot of you know that if there's no vital records, if birth, death, or marriage records weren't collected at the time period you're looking at, you have to figure out what other document would have cre been created at the time period that you're researching that's going to give you the answer to your question. So if you're looking for a birth or a death, you might need to use a cemetery book. You might need to use a will or probate. If you're looking in that time period of abyss between 1880 and 1900, where the 1890 census doesn't exist, you might need to use tax records to put a person in a location in a specific time period. That's exactly what we want to do. So let's look at some examples. I've got sort of like my little travel log of books that we have at the library, just to get you a little familiar with some of what our stuff looks like. We have a lot of what we call sort of social histories and deep histories, and then also guidebooks. So here we have a book on Polish American family history research, a guidebook on going home. Here's a book about this happy land, the Jews of colonial and antebellum Charleston. When you do family history, you don't do it in a vacuum. Family history is part of social history, part of the larger picture. So sometimes the questions as to why can be answered in reading some of these social histories like the Jews of Colonial Annabelle and Charleston. What was going on at that time period? So how that might have affected your family to do some things. Why did they leave Ohio and go to Indiana? Why did they come from Eastern Europe and go to New York? All that will help you in your family history research. As I mentioned, our material is organized alphabetically by state and then by county or parish. And what we've done is, as you can see, the little labels across the top, super easy to find what it is you're looking for. So if you're in the area in Houston, we invite you to come to the library and just walk to the shelf and start looking. You can see that there's some cemetery books, history books, marriage books, all the kind of stuff that we use. I just I like using that word stuff because that's what we're looking for. I need stuff. And then of course, we also have atlases. This is an early atlas of Vermont. As I mentioned, we are an international collection, strength being in the Gulf Coast. And then we also have some material that you might find at other genealogy libraries or other libraries, public libraries that have a genealogy collection that set Germans to America, passenger lists arriving in US ports. There's also Italians to America, Russians to America. It's a whole series of books. A very common book that you uh, can find in a lot of genealogy libraries. 
So we do have a lot of that supplemental material. And then of course, just in time for your next webinar, here's a book, How to Archive Family Photos, Step-by-Step -step Guide to Organize and Sharing Your Photos Digitally. That might help you with your next webinar. So we do have a lot of handbooks. Our material does not circulate. So when you use our catalog, and I'll show you how to do that in a little while, you will know that we are, that the material that you're looking for in the catalog will be here on the shelves. One of the things I specifically want to talk about is, I know that these are some interesting titles, but when you do go to a shelf and you do look at the books, you need to sort of think broadly. Um, I like to use the example, the skeletons in the closet, 200 years of murder in old Virginia. You might not think that you had an ancestor that was murdered, but your ancestor might have been a witness. Your ancestor might have been a victim. Your ancestor might have been a judge, a juror. You know, um, so you have to go to the shelves and pick the books out that even if they cover the time period that your family was there in Loudoun County, Apprentices, Poor Children and Bastards in Loudoun County, Virginia. Was your family in Loudoun County in Virginia in that time period? You should pull off that book because again, it might be sort of a collateral type of event that got your ancestor into the book. And then just as an example, during the Civil War, states and then the federal government did give artificial limbs to soldiers both confederate and union there are some other things that we have lists and stuff like that that you can look at but this is just another example so you have to be evaluative when you're looking at those books just like you have to be evaluative when you're online and looking at the collections what can what am i looking for and what can help me out and what time period so you really need to be to sort of hone in and we'll talk a little bit about formulating that research question in a few minutes. And as an example, just as an example, these are two examples of genealogy magazines. This is a South Carolina magazine of ancestral research. You can see that there's records of the Ebenezer Lutheran Church. Those records might not be anyplace else. Lawrence District Coroner's Inquisitions some Charleston voters. I have seen Swedish, Wisconsin listings in Texas periodicals. So that's why Percy is important in that index because sometimes information from a different geographic location ends up in a periodical that is completely not related. Many of you go to genealogy society meetings or have groups where they create a publication and sometimes the newsletter editor, the quarterly editor will say, I need three pages just to finish out this quarterly. And somebody says, I have landowners from Beaver Creek, Oregon, and you're in Pennsylvania. And the editor just grabs those pages. And now you have articles from Beaver Creek, Oregon in a Pennsylvania periodical. You need to be using Percy to try and find and identify it because there are gems in these periodicals. There's ethnic periodicals also. This is the International Review of Jewish Genealogy, Abu Tenu. Talks a lot about, obviously, Jewish research in the United States and then also Eastern Europe and other places. So downstairs is our geographic material. We have a two-story building. You'll see the picture of the brown brick building that we saw at the first slide is our building. So upstairs, we happen to have family histories. We have other things, we have microfilm also. So family histories, let's talk about these. So I'm sure we're familiar with these. They are written by people just like us. They were printed out on dot matrix printers. They were printed out fancily and bound fancily. They come spiral bound and you never know what's in them, whether it's your family or not, but you should be investigating what family histories have been written about your family. You can use our catalog. You can use the family history catalog. We'll talk about the family history books through Family Search in a second, because there might be a little gem in there, and it might save you years of research. So we have about fifteen thousand family histories, alphabetical by surname. They are filed by the most prominent surname or the surname named in the title. So you gotta kind of be careful when you use these and using an online catalog 
is one of the best things that you can do because if you're searching for a Taverner family and that Taverner family was part of the Wrens, Parsons, and, uh, and Smiths, and you are the family histories are organized alphabetically by surname and you go to the T's looking for the Taverners, but it's a book about the Wrens and you didn't go to the Wren family to the W's, you might be missing that, that book. So using an online catalog in addition to browsing is one of the most important things that you can do for yourself because that will really make you a more efficient researcher. So we have a lot of these family histories. Again, they stay in the library. Some of them have been digitized through family search. I'll show you those in a second, like I mentioned. But again, copyright. If they were printed after 1924 and they show copyright in this book, in the books, they will not be digitized unless the author has given family search the permission to digitize them. Copyright. Microfilm. Take your Dramamine. I always had to. Microfilm has always made me motion sick, but it's old school. And it's always fun when we have kids like middle school kids come and we pull out and say, what's, you know, what's this, you know, it's like, you have to go like the old movie projectors and they don't remember the old movie projectors because of course, they had not engaged the old movie projectors, they stream on their devices. So we pull it out and then we show them the little, little squares and they're just like, wow, and we put it on the machines. We have some really interesting things and it can be very difficult to use. Some of you that have engaged it, I'm sure are shaking your heads now because it often looks like this. <laughs> no index, no nothing, and you really have to concentrate. What this actually is, is this is actually the Orphan's Court from Washington, uh, actually the District of Columbia. And in this document, um, Samuel Turner is the Samuel Turner, the father, is giving up his son Samuel and George to Joseph Brooks in 1805, and that's a really important thing to to sort of note. 1805 to learn the art of joinery, but in this document in 1805, prior to vital records, prior to birth records. We learn that George was 10 years old and was born on the 30th of July. So using our deductive reasoning, this is 1805, we now know that George was born in 1795 without a vital record. So using this type of material that is not what I call fast food genealogy, it's not like putting a name in in family search or ancestry and getting a result. This is, I'm going to spend the day at the library looking through stuff, can be very, 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 um, what's the word, fruitful to, to use. But it, there are times that we have to begin to slow down. I know that I'm trying to disconnect from some of my devices because we've all gotten so fast and so multitask, and we really have to begin to kind of step back and breathe. So... Some of these documents are unique that aren't fine digitized and they list birth dates before the birth records and you can show family groups. So we have a lot of this and you'll see, of course, a lot of it digitized on family search, but sometimes there are unique things at the sources. A couple other unique things that we have here at the library, we have a map collection and then some of you might have been doing research for long enough where you remember vertical files. There on the right is a picture of our family vertical files. We have about 25 drawer file cabinets that are not digitized, that are only at this location of stuff. Again, of, of things like pedigree charts, of family letters, of documents that have been copied or given to us in these files that are organized alphabetical by surname. We do have a surname index that we have not mounted on our webpage yet, and we are going through a process of digitizing some of the material from those files to mount up on our website so we can entice people to come on the ground to do research. But this again is some of the unique sources um, that we have here at Clayton, and we'll talk about some of the unique sources 
in some of my history and in what I've done in my genealogy librarianship career. But to find out what we have here at Houston Public, this is our website, houstonlibrary.org. So what you're going to do is, is you're going to search our catalog. So what's interesting is, is I did a search, you can see some of my searches, Revolutionary War. When you do a search, so it's houstonlibrary.org is our website. When you do a search in the Houston Public Library catalog, you have to understand for us and also for a lot of public libraries and other libraries, in fact, you are searching a catalog that is organizationally wide, which means for us that we have 46 locations. We have 43 neighborhood libraries and we have three special collections. So when you do that library catalog search, public libraries, university libraries, you have to understand what the results are giving you and how to cull through those results. So in this search, the example that I have in our catalog, searching Revolutionary War, I get 937 results. But remember, we are one of 46 locations. We are not a standalone library. So what happens is, is you have the opportunity to limit down. And you, when you start looking at a web page, whether it's our catalog, whether it's a database, so many of us just want to put that name in the magic box. But you have to become familiar what the content of those databases are and how to effectively research those. So of those 937 hits, knowing that we are one of 46 locations, you should say, oh, well, what's really at Clayton? On the left-hand side of the search screen, the results search screen, there is a way to limit it down to libraries. And you can see a number of our libraries listed. So when I limited it down to Clayton, there are 300 books that we have at Clayton out of that 937. So that is an effective research technique. Understand, especially in a public library, how many, how many locations are there and how many books are there in that source that you're looking for. Also, there's other ways to search, whether you're searching for subject, searching for title, searching for author. I just want to get you aware of the fact that you, there is a way to narrow it down in some effective research techniques. So that was limiting it down to Clayton. If you are lucky enough, well, I say I, I, like, I, I like being in Texas because I like, it's 80 degrees here today. So I don't know where you are. I just, but remember I'm from Illinois, so I really miss the seasons. But if you are in Texas, up on the left-hand side there where it says get a MyLink card, anybody with a Texas driver's license statewide can get a Houston Public Library card. Maybe you know somebody who lives in Texas. Reason I'm telling you this is because we have databases that are accessible from home. So after you get your MyLink card with your Texas ID or driver's license, you click on the word research, you'll click on the word genealogy, and then what that will do is, is it will take you to our databases. I just gave you one slide of this. We have, um, we have some that are accessible in library use only. You can see our newspapers there. You would, we have some that are accessible from home. Fold 3 is one. My Heritage is accessible from home. Now these are library editions, not full-blown subscriptions. We have subscription to Ancestry in library use only. There are some other databases that we have that you can access from home, like I said, with that Houston Public Library card that you can get online. One of the things I want to mention, and you should look at your own library and see what kind of databases they have for you, but a lot of databases that, that the library offers can be used for family history research, okay? Remember I talked about how we don't do genealogy in a vacuum. We sit in a larger social history. If you look at this list here, you can see that there is a history and social sciences component that we have. There is encyclopedia and dictionaries. There is some language learning. 
There are bio biographical data categories that we have, African-American studies. You need to sort of think outside the box, if you will, and wonder what's in those history and social sciences databases. As an example, until recently, we have a database in the genealogy component called American Civil War. In the genealogy component, it was only regiments and soldiers. Sitting in the history and social science component was the American Civil War letters and diary part of the same database. They both now reside on the genealogy page, but until we got those moved over, if you did not look at that history and social sciences component, you would have missed that letters and diaries. This is important, especially when you engage university libraries. You have to think about what databases, if you have the, the ability to go to a university near you and sit on campus and get some of those on, on, um, on-site databases, what do those databases do for you that can help you with your family history research? You have to think outside of the box because it's great to get names, dates, and places, but if there's no stories behind them, I imagine that some of you out there, when you start talking about family history and you pull out that pedigree chart or you pull out that family group sheet, people run, but if you start talking about stories, you can get them to sit there. So you have to be able to see what else is out there and put your family in context. I mentioned the Family Search Digital, and I mentioned Family Search a lot. We are a partner of a library partner, a library digital partner of Family Search. We are one of, I think there might be 16, 18 libraries that are partners of the Family Library, Family Search Digital Library. What that means is we have missionaries here in our location digitizing material basically pre-1924. There are over 400,000 books available on the Family Search Digital Library that are completely OCR, which means that they're optical character recognition, which means that you can put in your family name in this box and up will come books that are applicable to your search. You can put in a location, you can put in a family name, and when you click on the book, what you get is, is you get the book, you can search inside the book and hopefully maybe find some of your family. Not only are there family histories, there are cemetery books, there are military information. So there's over 400,000 books there. We are one, the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana. You saw the BYU Library. Uh, the Dallas Public Library, the Mid-Continent Public Library, Pennsylvania, California, Florida, all attached to FamilySearch as a library partner, which means that there is some access available inside that library that you can't get other places, but unique content. When we send up a book to Family Search, these are our missionaries. We've had missionaries here since 2008. These are our current missionaries, the Simons. They came from Idaho to Houston. If you don't think the traffic was shocking to them, you've got another thing coming. There's 4 million people in Houston. They came from rural Idaho. They, <laughs> they signed up for 23 months, and this is their digital closet. And well, their office, we call it the closet. They call it the closet, the small room. So the Simons come and they go to the shelf. They take the books. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, the digital process down in the lower right-hand corner, the digital process. What there are, there's unique content that only comes from us and it's not duplicated. Missionaries and all those libraries that are listed on the digital project go to the shelves, pick books, digitize material that is unique to libraries and then also is also probably things that are in other libraries. Sometimes if three libraries have the same book, it's whoever sends the book up to Orem to check for the book first and then they send it back and say, sorry, it's already being done and whatever library is doing it does it. But they have done over 100,000 pages since July. They scan for 40 hours a week. 
So that is sort of a, just a quick overview. You can see in the back are where our computers are on the back of this picture. That's sort of a quick overview and trying to get you to understand that libraries are still viable. We invite you to Texas to come and see some of our unique material. You're, you have a bonus if you live in Texas, you can get a library card. You can also get a library card if you live out of state for $40. If you go to houstonlibrary.org, you can also you can click on get a MyLink card and you can pay for a year to get access to some of those databases also. But it's just sort of an overview to get you to understand that libraries are still viable and there's plenty of stuff there in addition to the staff that's important to use. So let's talk about taking a trip really quick, all right? We're trying to talk about plan your visit. You gotta go over what you have at home. You have to figure out what you wanna know. We talked about searching a catalog. Know about the places that you're going and everything's not online. All right, we're familiar with this, right? This is your map, your guide, your organizational help. It helps the information professional that you're talking to. It helps you to look at your research. This is going to get you organized to figure out what you want to know. It helps us because after 40 hours in, of doing research a week for some for helping people, we need some, some time of visual conception because you know your family like your back hand, but the back of your hand, but we don't know your family like the back of your hand. So it helps us. What you can't fill out becomes your research questions. Research is a process. The formulation of the questions are the key to an effective research plan. Being able to articulate what you're looking for is the most important thing. Whether you're talking to us here at the library, whether you're talking to courthouse staff, or even your relative who doesn't do family history, especially when you're talking to somebody that is not specifically like us, family history librarians, okay? Because when you go into a courthouse, they don't want to hear your whole story. They just want to know what you want. Whether they give it to you or not or have it is another story. But being effective, being able to say, who do you want to work on? What do you want to know? Where and what time period are you researching? It's kind of like, you know, when you go to Target and you say this and somebody says, can I help you? And you say you want the plastic stuff, but you really want the garbage can. Would have saved you some time if you said you wanted the garbage can so you didn't have to walk up and down the aisles looking for the garbage cans. You have to be direct and formulate your query. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't develop a dialogue with you. That doesn't mean that we here at Clayton and other family history information professionals will not develop a dialogue, but that helps you formulate your, your research because if you're taking a destination trip and you've got that certain amount of time and you're spending money and your family is there with you, you need to be as most efficient when you walk into a repository. So when you walk in and you're able to articulate, we can begin to help you figure out what sources we have that's going to help you answer your specific question. So let's talk about trying to find some places to go. We're going to talk quick about public libraries and universities. And what we're going to do is, is I'm going to give you this website. It's called LibWeb. This is a directory to libraries worldwide. We talked a little bit about thinking outside of the public library. What do university libraries have? Remember, there's courses, there's departments, history, sociology is taught there. They might have dissertations. So how can you find these things? This is a directory to libraries, United States, worldwide, Canada. And you can see that each component has academic libraries, public libraries, state libraries, and on. What happens is when you begin to engage this, I just happen to pick public libraries, and you can pick your state. And what you get is a listing of libraries by name, uh, by location, okay? Well, or by the, by the name of the library, by the name of the library. What happens, my example here is the Allerton Public Library, Monticello, Illinois. Maybe you didn't know, so when you're back here and you're searching Illinois and you get into it and you don't know that in Monticello it's called the Allerton Public Library, you actually can search by location and that will get you to the library. 
So I happened to pick the Allerton Public Library now. And what happened was, is when I clicked on this, I got that. Pretty bad, right? So I am not saying that LibWeb is the only way to find the library. You can Google the library. You could have put in Monticello Public Library and up would have come the Allerton Public Library. This is just another way to engage some of those special libraries, university libraries, archives, and things like that. Just another source to put your wheelhouse of research. One of the examples that I have is the Peoria Public Library. The Peoria Public Library is where I started in Illinois. It's a little tiny library. And when we talked about unique collections, they have a local history genealogy collection that of course is Peoria, it's central Illinois, Peoria and the surrounding counties, but there is material at that library. There's photographs, there's indexes, there's vertical files that are, that are not held in any other library whatsoever. So this is why you need to do this on the ground research. So when you look at a public library, our friend in the word is research. That's our friend, because that's what we do. We can see that when we clicked on research, there's the secret word, genealogists, because libraries know that we're gonna go. It's that simple. They know. When I was in library school in Illinois in 1999, I was the only genealogy librarian. And I had medical librarians and school librarians and special librarians and business librarians. And I would do presentations on, all my presentations were around sort of family history, serving family history customers. And I kept saying, they're gonna come, they're gonna come. And now family history is one of the biggest hobbies, pursuits, it's not even really a hobby, it's a pursuit. And so people recognize that, yes, libraries are very valuable in doing research. So when I clicked on genealogy, now remember I said that they have a lot of things there in terms of special stuff. There's, you know, like I mentioned, photographs and stuff like that. It doesn't indicate that at their local history and genealogy section on their website. So what you can do is, is you also want to look for something called Ask a Librarian. University libraries, public libraries, ask a librarian because you can make a phone call and you can ask them what they have. What is unique? I did a, a card catalog search. I searched for the word genealogy alone. I got 5,700, this is still in Peoria, 5,700 links or 5,700 books. When I limited it down to Peoria cemeteries because I narrowed it down to got to the garbage cans, the Peoria cemetery, I got 64 results. There is a list. Does the library do research? Is there a genealogy society that does research? Maybe you don't have to go there. The Quincy Public Library, as an example, see the keyword here? They don't have research. They have the keyword local history because especially in local public libraries, they might not have big genealogy collections, but they have local history collections. Big local history collections, small local history collections. Clicking on that local history link, you can see some of their genealogy stuff that they have. And then also you get a little information. Quincy, Illinois is along the Mississippi River. Here's a little history that gives you about Quincy. So again, you can learn about some of the background of the area. And in addition to that, what's interesting about Quincy is, is it goes on and talks a little bit about research your family tree with the genealogy resources. It tells you some of the databases that they have. But Quincy has a newspaper archive. The Quincy newspaper archive is published between, the newspaper was published between 1835 and May 1926, are available online. The Quincy, Illinois newspaper is only available at the Quincy Public Library. Again, we think about newspapers.com. We think about those newspaper databases that we have at the library. But what is small? What does the local library have? Are there regional newspaper consortiums? Not everything is out there on those big guys. You have to begin to think about locally. You have to begin to think about creatively. Where is the stuff that's going to answer my question? Additionally to that, when you go to universities, 
often you're going to look for that word special collections this is appalachian state university they have digital collections postcards this is boone uh, north carolina they're um in i can't it's watauga county i think uh there's all kinds of, of documents and manuscripts and photographs and postcards again that will help you might not give you a name or a date but it'll give you social history but also you can search by name there might have been a funeral or something like that there are also state memory projects that you can find using family search and the research wiki you should always use the research wiki let's start a family search i searched manuscripts upcome i'm in the wiki here upcome different manuscripts medieval manuscripts, Hampshire archives, the Draper manuscript collection. I found the Wisconsin Historical Society. Again, information about a place, internet databases, hours and holidays, so you don't go when they're closed or at their lunch. And then also a collection description, guides that can help you learn about what's there for you. Other neighboring collections, that'll help you with the Kenosha Public Library, Wisconsin, Madison. Again, what is not at the big guys? What is at the location? Special collections, University of South Florida special collections. Here's the Albuquerque County Library special collections. Some libraries call it special collections like we do. Some places call it history research centers. Some people call it genealogy. Some people call it local history. But you need to get educated on what it is that you have alternate repositories again in New Mexico. Here's a big guy, WorldCat. Some of you might be familiar with WorldCat. WorldCat is a worldwide online library catalog for books, manuscripts, and archival material. WorldCat.org is the website. What you can do is, is I search for Loudoun County, Virginia cemeteries, up came books. But again, over on the left, you can limit it down to archival material, manuscript materials. You can limit it down to theses and dissertations, which might help you if you're looking for slave narratives or information about a location or a time period that, again, is about a, about a history of an area. And then what will happen is, is when you click on it, I clicked on Union Cemeteries to see the book. Here's the information of the book search the catalog at your library, but you can find out by zip code what libraries in the area own that title. And if there is a digital copy, if you read into what we call the bibliographic record, the information about the book, it will take you to a digital copy of that book. But again, this is just another database to try and find material that might not be digitized. You might have to go to I, if I put another zip code, there are multiple pages. There's more than three or four pages of this book and who owns this book. Putting in a zip code and you wanted that Loudoun County book, it might be in a library near you and then you can go there. If it's not near you, do they do interlibrary loan? Will they photocopy an index? Is there a genealogy society in the area? Does the library offer photocopying? Ask a librarian. This is worldcat.org. That's a huge, quick overview of what we've got going on here. The big important thing is understand where you're going. Use a catalog before you go, formulate your question, think about what it is that you want to research, call, ask if there's somebody that you can talk to before you go. Is there somebody that's specialized? What do they have that's unique? investigate your own public library not only do libraries have genealogy collections but if you go to the regular public library ever look in a cookbook and find information about an ethnicity or a place or or an area um, there's a book called death warmed over it's about funeral food ethnic funeral food it's called death warmed over Go into the kids section and read a book on Romania or on a state to get a little history of that state before you embark on that research. One of the most important things is to keep calm and set your goals and have a good time.
And that's the end of my presentation. I hope you learned something, you guys. Karen? Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have the, uh, the chat open for questions. Um, if you have any questions, I'll read those out and so you can answer those. So we'll just give that another minute. And if nobody has questions in the next minute or two, then we'll move on to the closing announcements. I just hope everybody took away something. That's my thing. <laughs> so it's OK that there's no questions. Um, someone did comment, thank you for all your work. Oh, that's sweet. You are so welcome. I love what I do. I'm very fortunate. And someone else commented, uh, they're from uh, Mineral, Washington, uh, Leslie Dunlap. She said, it was great. I learned a lot. Thank you, Leslie, very much. I appreciate that. That was really sweet. Ask, talk to your local librarian. We'd love to see you in Texas if you ever come down. <laughs> All right. And if you guys have any more questions um, later on, you can email me those at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. And I will send those on to Sue. Our next webinar will be on the 5th. And following that, um, that Thursday, I believe that is the 12th, yep, the 12th of December, we'll have a webinar with Catherine Grant, and that'll be um, the end of our webinars for this year. Uh, we will send out a update on the calendar for January, so you can get excited for the upcoming webinars next year. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to email me at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. And a recording of this webinar will be made available on our YouTube page and on our website. Thank you so much. We hope that you have a wonderful Thanksgiving and a wonderful weekend. Thank you.